you. Thank you so much, Billy. And good morning, Naples Community Church family. So wonderful to see you. Happy Mother's Day to everyone. You, you ladies who have had children or adopted or fostered, I'll tell you, my hat is off. Your patience, your love, your compassion, your discipline, just everything that you have gone through. Thank you so much. And now you get to bestow all that love on grandchildren. And those of us who didn't have children, well, I had my, my number of animals that I loved and <laughs> children and all kinds of people in my life. And so happy Mother's Day to everybody. All, all the mothers just look so bright and beautiful. And thank you. Just a big, big, big thank you. Sandrea, thank you so much for kicking us off as we sit down and as we hug and and get to know, you know, get put love on each other, as Pastor loves to say, yes, Jesus loves me, is what she played, and that was so gorgeous. Thank you, Sandrea. I'd like to just start off with um, introducing one of our sharp-dressed men. Um, <laughs> I'd love his easy top we're here right now, but we got Pat O'Connor, who has such a heart for others, and... <laughs> I had a little punchline, a heart for others and a wardrobe for Vegas. Okay, it took a lot of guts to wear this at church, but that was part of the bid. This was uh, called Crazy Pants on Wednesday. It was a fundraiser for the Pace Center for Girls. We raised over $100,000 that night. Yep. We had um, 20 models, as they called us. Only really two could have been models. Um, we had the sheriff and under sheriff, a couple of politicians were in it also. And the highest bid on these pants came from the church family that were there. With a stipulation, I had to wear this on Sunday. So, for charity, absolutely. So, thank you all. And Billy, you're getting these pants, okay? <laughs> thank you. And you have to go give him a hug. He owns this jacket. It is so soft. He did not rent this jacket. This is his leopard. Whatever it is, I love, you're the best. Thank you, Patrick and Brenda, you guys. Thanks for all you do. <laughs> so our announcements for today, I know it's all downhill from there. Just Pat, thanks for kicking us off. Uh, we have Sunday prayer, which thank you so much to our prayer warriors. We all feel it. We know that the Holy Spirit's in. You've invited him in, and boy, is that something that we all need. We hope our hearts are opened so that we have that love and that forgiveness and that grace and that we can hear the words that Pastor is going to be sharing with us today. We have Bible study on Mondays, and Dawn adds so much wisdom to our journey through the Bible. She's in 2 Samuel chapters 19 and 21, so we have... 12 o'clock for everybody and 6 p.m. for the ladies. You can zoom in or you can be right here in the sunshine room. Thank you, Dawn. Wednesday issues hour. Pastor takes us through a great discussion, 11 o'clock, right here again in the sunshine room where you can zoom in. And the men have uh, their men's, men's lunch and it's when the third Wednesday of the month, so they meet the first and third. So come on out to the Issues Hour and then go over to Blueberries after that for a great fellowship with the men. Love that. Member Spotlight is next Sunday. We're so excited to get to meet you, Millers, more. Don't, don't give me that face. You're going to love it. You're going to just love talking about yourself, right? Like we all do. <laughs> We pray over, that's right, have a great week preparing for that. And we have a memorial service on June 3rd for Carson Beadle. Thank you. Um, we, have the de we have the details now, 4 o'clock on Saturday, June 3rd. Everyone come and, and just love on Mary Elizabeth and her family in memory of Carson. Thank you, Mary Rush, for these beautiful flowers today. Mary Rush has two mothers her bio mother, and her adopted mother. So thank you so much to, to you, Mary, for honoring your mothers today with these beautiful flowers. And thank you for the people who provided the cookies. I think the hospitality team did. Don't forget to sign up. We have, for people who are new, we have sign-ups in the back. And we just like to know who's attending so that we can prepare, whether it's a luncheon or a movie. So June sign-ups are in the back. We have June 9th 
as Ladies' Lunch. That's a Friday. So Friday, June 9th, that's going to be super fun. We have a movie night Wednesday, June 14th. We're going to see Jesus Revolution. So for those of you who haven't seen it, it's $10, which is a bargain. And for those of us who have seen it, it's a great time to come again. And I'll tell you, it's a great way to invite non-believers or maybe a lukewarm believer. I'll tell you, this movie's really fun. The soundtrack's incredible. It's, it's great music from the 60s, I think it is, or the 70s. And what else? We have an all-church brunch. So Sunday after church on the 18th of June, we all meet at the church brunch. I'm, I'm not seeing where it is, but put that on your calendars for Sunday, June 18th. And I think that's it. Oh, we have more Bibles from our anonymous Bible giver. So thank you, Wally, for that. And, <laughs> and please silence your cell phones. Open your hearts to what Pastor Kurt has for us today. Love you guys.
who wondrous things have done, through whom we all rejoice, who from our mother's arms have led us on our way. Oh, may this boundless love through all our lives be given. Lord, we can't all be mothers, but we all have mothers. And we're so thankful for their sacrifice and love and pain that brought us into this world. We thank you for the mothers that are in your presence, gone to their great reward, to their heavenly father, to their heavenly home. We thank you for mothers that are still with us, that we might show them our love and gratitude and appreciation and respect for all that they have given. Father, we thank you for your parental, fatherly love as a mother hand gathers us to yourself Thank you that, Heavenly Father, you love us as a parent unconditionally. Thank you for your loving care. Lord, we pray that our nation, our culture, would value mothers, that we would value babies in their womb, that we would respect the biblical model of womanhood in our land, that, again, women would be respected and admired for their model of unconditional love. Lord Jesus, we bow before you as needy people. We need you in our world. We need you in our culture, in our nation, in our city, in our church. And we humbly ask for your visitation upon our land. May your Holy Spirit move in our midst today, this morning, at Naples Community Church as we worship and as we learn and as we enjoy fellowship together. May you be exalted in our city, in our state, in our nation, in our world. May we give you the proper acknowledgement of your sovereignty in our lives. Thank you for your great love that sent your Son, our Savior, to the cross, that rose him from the dead, that we might live with you forever. May we, in humble, simple faith, trust you for your grace and your salvation. And we pray for the needs in our church, this long list of people that we love and pray for. We ask for your visitation, for your healing, for your restoration in their lives. We ask your presence now. Open our hearts and minds to worship you aright, to learn from your word. Anoint Pastor Kurt as he shares your teaching, your word with us all. We pray this in the name of your son, our savior, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Be seated. There is a candle in every soul, some brightly burning. Some dark and cold There is a spirit Which brings a fire Ignites a candle 
and makes his home. Carry your candle, run to the darkness, seek out the hopeless, confused and torn. Hold out your candle for all to see it. Take your candle and go light your world. Frustrated brother, see how he's tried to light his own candle some other way see now your sister she's been robbed and lied to still holds a candle without a flame so carry your candle run to the darkness seek out the lonely the tired and worn carry your candle for all to see it take your candle and go light your We are a family whose hearts are blazing. So let's raise our candles and light up the sky. Praying to our Father in the name of Jesus. Make us a beacon in darkest times. So can Run to the darkness, seek out the helpless, deceived and poor. Carry your candle for all to see it. Take your candle and go light your world. Take your candle. And we need it. We need the light. Depending on where we are, who we're involved with, and what relationships we have, there is also plenty of darkness. There's so many things that darken our world. This past week, week and a half, I've been dealing with a family subject of horrific abuse, wife and children. and uh, and. As a pastor, I go in and almost anything I do, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what to do, what to say. I just know that I embody something and that's, that's kind of the best I can do. Listen, try to absorb, try to feel with. And, and so it is. And just um, yesterday I was driving in my neighborhood and here's a young mom the dog on a leash, a baby in a carriage, and a little boy who needed to be on a leash. <laughs> and I was just, I mean, it's an ordinary scene, but it's so, by its ordinariness, it was so beautiful, so very stunning. What a world we live in, that, that God would make that a part of everyday life. It is such a gift. So, the Lord gives us plenty of light, and we do what we can to make sure that that light gets spread. Also, I learned this week, our dear brother, one of the founders of our church, and a, a truly wonderful man, Wally Abbott, we lost 
this week. And uh, so we haven't seen Wally and Jan in some time because they decided to stay at the Moorings Park Chapel for the last five years or so. But um, I nevertheless have stayed close with them. And, and uh, so we'll, those of you particularly who know Jan will want to keep her and the family in your prayers. And uh, Rebecca Sumlin is going into treatment this week. She begins radiation. She has a, a tumor, and so she's going to be receiving some radiation for that. Um, Carol Summerfield is continuing at NCH as of this morning um, and has had some episodes. I'm not even sure what they are, but um, it's been a tough run for her as well as for, for John. And, of course, we continue to pray for our our dear brother, our, our walking miracle, uh, Brian Vale, and of course his wife. And we, we continue in our love for you both. Let's bow together. Oh Lord God, with even the least bit of sensitivity, we're moved by both the overwhelming beauty as well as by the incomprehensible evil that is in this world. We thank you, Lord, that it's your promise to us not, as to, not to take us out of this world, not to make it easy, but your presence is your promise. And we're reminded in your word that you have indeed conquered this world. It's a world that needs you. It's a world that needs it's your protection, your oversight. And Lord, why do we rebel? Why do we go the other way? Why is it that we think we can do it better than you can? Instead, Lord, we, we pray that, that you would take the wheel of our lives. You would guide us, that you would direct us. And, and yes, we, we get stubborn. We, we want to do the driving. But Lord, may we at least drive on the road that you have set before us and not take those other forks that will lead to perdition. And dear Father, may, may we as your, your children, may we as your people recognize that the fullness of life, the deepest joy of life is not found in so many of the things that we pursue. It's found in relationships, the most fundamental of which is a mother and her child. And the surrounding realities of family that support that primary unit, family and friends and church and, and relationships from which we derive nurture and care. And dear Father, as we do, we recognize our calling to serve. That there are so many people who need something that we might be able to give. I thank you, O oh Lord, for the many ways that you show on our path ways that we might pause and provide service. Dear Father, we, we pray that your, your people, your, your children, your, your church might have the kind of influence that is that of le the, the yeast in the loaf, that we might be that light, of however small, set on the lampstand that brings light to the darkened world that we might represent you in such a way that others might recognize that in the light is hope, in the light is life, in the light is your Son, our Savior Christ, who when he was with us taught us how we should pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we're going to take our offering this morning, but I want to put a warning out to our trustees that someone gave me two $1 million bills this morning, and they may show up in the plate. And uh, I just want you to make sure, hold it up to the light or something like that, make sure that what Pat O'Connor gave me is real. <laughs> we bring to the Lord our tithes and offerings. Now, Father, be merciful upon us. Grant us your truth. May we be transformed by your spirit. And may we show honor. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's an interesting passage in Hebrews, 11th chapter, where the writer of Hebrews is detailing the great heroes of the faith, and he, he writes, it was by faith that Moses' parents hid him, hid him from, for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's commands. Well, <clears throat> so the writer of Hebrews includes the father of Moses. But the text, which we're going to look at today, has nothing to do with the dad. It's all about the mom and other women. As a matter of fact, we don't even know the Pharaoh's name, but we do know the name of the midwives who are going to act in defiance of Pharaoh. Now, the text also refers to the two midwives whose names we have as Hebrew women, but the Hebrew in this case is ambivalent. It could be women of the Hebrews or women to the Hebrews. I think they were Egyptian women, and that they were acting as midwives to the Hebrew women. 
And Pharaoh brings them in and tells them, well, hear the word of God. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Pardon me, I'm starting in the wrong place. Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. And so the king of Egypt called for the midwives, what have you done? Why have you done this, he demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. And so God was good to the midwives and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all of his people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. About this time, a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that it was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the banks of the Nile River. The baby's sister then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maids to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own. The princess named him Moses. For she explained, I lifted him out of the water. May God, may God add his understanding to this hearing of his word. And so this is one of those instances in which we either fear God or we fear anything. If we fear God, reality is we have nothing to fear. And these women acting in absolute defiance to the most powerful man in the known world at that time feared God. And, and I love this because when he called them into his chamber to ask what they had done by letting these Hebrew women give birth, they lied to him. You know, it's not a bad thing to lie to a really bad person. <laughs> they lied to him. But also the, the language, the, we, we've, used, we've used some rather delicate language in this case. They say, well, the Hebrew women are vigorous. They have those babies so fast, we just can't get there in time. Another way, and perhaps the most accurate way of translating this, is those Hebrew women are animals. And that would fit the whole mentality of a slaveholder with his slaves, of, a, of a, a dictator with those who he expects to bow down to him. Those animals. So the midwives leave, probably smiling. 
and this little baby is born. And we don't know until later that it's Amram and Jochebed that are the parents. Born to Moses, Moses is born to this couple, and they love this little baby, and yet at three months old, you know what happens. Babies get loud, especially little boys, and they just cannot keep him quiet enough, and so they're worried that, that the Egyptians, someone out there might come in and try to take this child from them. And so they put the baby in a basket and float it down the river. And as God's hand would pr protect this child, as providence would have it, and, and mom sends a baby, terrified, you can imagine how she feels sending a little three-month-old down the river and so she sends her daughter, who's older, to, to watch as the basket goes down the river. And as it goes, and here comes the princess of Egypt, the daughter of Pharaoh. And she has her attendants with her, and she's coming down to bathe in the, in the Nile. And she sees this basket, she has her attendants go pick it up, she looks, and here is this little boy. And, and who can do anything but love such a thing? A little boy in a basket. Who can do anything but, but cherish a child such as that? And so the sister comes up. Tell you what, I know somebody who can midwife, uh, pardon me, who can nurse this child. Brings her mom. And it turns out that Moses grows up at least beyond, at least, the time of weaning, which was considered to be four or five years old at that time. And this little boy is raised essentially in the house into which he was born. But all of the players here, all of the players are the women acting in defiance. All of the players are those who understand what it is to be a mother more than anyone, and even those who've not had babies enter into this, this great mystery of nurturing the next generation and of loving this child. And so there's sort of a, a conspiracy of women that comes together. They coalesce over against this incredibly powerful man who would kill people at nothing. But the women come together and do this. And one of my problems, as I've said, with fundamentalists is that they're not fundamental enough. And one of my problems with liberals is they're not liberal enough. So the Old Testament is, is considered to be, oh, it's all patriarchal and, you know, it's all men ruling and all that sort of thing, until you do a good reading of the Old Testament. It honors women. It has a high regard for women. At some point this week, this week, just read Proverbs 31 and how it elevates the woman. And yes, there's some stuff in there that reflects the cultural realities of, of, the, of the time. But if the fundamentalists would read beyond that and get down to the realities of how women are really treated, and the liberals, rather than looking for something with which to criticize the Old Testament, would look for something with which to understand the Old Testament, then they would see this, this great elevation. Even the story of creation, the woman is created last. And creation is a story of ascending complexity and sophistication, such that the last creation is the woman. And after that, God's done. And God leaves, and the woman is of such a magnificent nature that Adam is tempted to worship her. And for God, that's quite all right. And so we have this reality that we celebrate today. It's more than just that of mothers, because many cannot, cannot, could not have children or cannot have children. But we celebrate this reality of the, the woman as the, as the mother of all life, and even those who cannot bear children. 
nevertheless participate in that great mystery. And in the course of my ministry, I've, I've of course known women who, for one reason or another, have lost a child. And there is a, a pain that cuts so very deep. As a, as a man, I'm not sure I can enter into that pain. But it's a deep and profound, a cosmic anguish, a cosmic pain. And so the woman, the woman is the mother of all things, is honored on such a day as this. Remember, I was, I was six or seven years old, something like that. Saturday morning. So when I was six or seven years old, you know what I was doing on a Saturday morning? I was not out working on the lawn with Dad. I was inside watching cartoons <laughs> because that's what you do on a Saturday morning. There were no cartoons all during the week, but Saturday morning was cartoon time. You know, Daffy Duck, Bugs Bunny, and all that great stuff. I still like to watch it every now and then, some of these old cartoons. So I'm inside with my sisters. We're watching cartoons. And Dad comes in from working on the lawn, and he, he makes this broad declaration. You've probably heard this kind of thing before. You kids do nothing around here. <laughs> and he turned to me, Kurt, you're lazy. <laughs> that really stuck with me. You're lazy. It was Saturday. Next day was Mother's Day. So at some point that afternoon, I went into the kitchen, went under the sink, and pulled out a a grocery bag. And I was going to prepare a Christmas, pardon me, a Mother's Day gift for mom. And did what I had to do, and the next day, after church, after dinner, after church, I was um, sitting at the table, mom and, mom and the girls and dad, and, and uh, there was a, a little bit of a fuss made because it was Mother's Day. And I reached under my chair and pulled out the paper bag. Mother looked in it, op opened it up, and pulled out what I put inside. It was a tangle of weeds. And Mother gave me a great big kiss. And she said, thank you, honey. She knew what I'd done. I went out and did some weeding in the yard. Aww. Not for dad, <laughs> but for mom. And she got it. And then in the last days of her life, mom it was either just dementia or Alzheimer's or whatever it might be. You know, those horrific afflictions that afflict so many of us. And a couple in my church, when I was over at First Press at uh, Christmas time, told me I needed to go out there. And they had miles. And so they let me have their miles to, to get out there and see the family. And it was always after Christmas, because we ministers do Christmas for everyone else. And, um, but we, we went out, and, and um, or I should say I went out. I just went out alone. Had this time at home with, with mom and dad and my sisters. And dad had set up a bed down in the dining room for mom, one of those hospital beds. And he had some... Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, et cetera, on, on the stereo playing softly. And the dining room looked out onto the back patio where Dad had Christmas lights hanging. So it was a beautiful scene. And that whole time, I was there for about a week, Mother didn't know me. 
And yet I, I would see her and go in and kiss her. I know some of you have been there. And it's such a hard thing for, for us when mom doesn't know who we are. So this morning I was going to leave. It was an early flight. I went downstairs into the, into the dining room where mom was. And I took her hand and I kissed her face and I just said, Mom, I love you so much. And she squeezed my hand and said, I love you, Kurt. The last words I ever heard from my mother were the first words I ever heard from my mother. And do we have any real acknowledgement or recognition that there is nothing in this life that replicates the divine love of God quite like the depth, primal, the deep primal love of our mothers for us? So that's, that's worth more than a card more than a bag of weeds. <laughs> it's worthy of our honor. And God commands us to do so in the fifth commandment. And so on such a day as this, this is an opportunity for us to acknowledge, remember, and honor. Will you join me in prayer? And so, Heavenly Father, we are grateful for that which is beyond our comprehension, but which we see all the time, which we experience with every breath. And that is that we have been loved, and in no small manner, we have been loved as you first loved us. And we are profoundly grateful and only hope, Lord, that the way we live might live up to the way that we've been loved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you please stand for our closing hymn?
And every time a child is born, we get a glimpse of the new creation, of what it means to be made new, to be remade in the image and likeness of God. And it establishes and restores for us a deep and profound hope that one day we will all be born anew into the kingdom of heaven. Go in peace. Live by faith. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and in the life everlasting. Amen.